Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now, historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to Fate Magazine here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I have got, well, I have to apologize to you and then I have to tell you, lucky you. We have had a glitch with being able to get Dr. Mary uh, Helen Hensley on. That's not right. But at any rate, it is right. We are not sure what is going on. I believe she is having some communication issues, but I am so lucky because I have my friend, and most of you probably know her as well. Her name is Michelle Freed. She is a remote viewer. She's also very big in, well, basically all fields of the paranormal. She's a promoter. She is a representative for different people in the field, and she's brilliant. So I think that we're very lucky. Michelle, I am so glad that you're here. Thank you for being with me. Uh, spontaneous, but we like spontane- spontaneity. Did I say that right? I don't know. Almost. Spontaneity. Yes, there you go. <laughs> All right. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's... Um, It's always one thing or another, but the good thing about doing this kind of thing is when you can be flexible and not completely wig out, right? Right. Absolutely. I am 
But you know, it's one thing that I have always found is that things always work out the way they're supposed to. Yeah. I I am a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer that there are no coincidences. And I've been wanting to talk to you for months anyway. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it just yeah it just worked out yeah it I was did. just kind of hanging out um not really doing anything uh very important just kind of chilling um there's really not a lot to do during the pandemic so yeah. um a lot of family time but sometimes family time gets a lot a lot like well, a lot right it does yeah and you know I am just so tired of the pandemic you know it seems to not be bringing out the best in all things and all people and you know I want to tell people that um I'm always I get called Pollyanna a lot but I really do think that even with all the people who are upset and hurting I have a a person in my family currently being tested for COVID and Mm. She was symptomatic a week ago, so maybe she will just be through the worst of it now. Um, And they wouldn't test her. She went to um, a hospital satellite, and they wouldn't test her. So shame on Mm. them. Mm, Um, That's, it's yeah. It's frustrating. And even with that, you know, you just have to sit there and say, okay, I I don't have control over this, but I can send energy toward it. Mm-hmm. And that kind of controls it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, it's putting I have it to, out there. Yeah, I have to say, I you know, I have um, kids that are um, college age kids. Mm-hmm. And when this happened, uh, they had to come back home. So we're all under one roof. I have three of them. And my daughter, uh, especially, I think, you know, the millennial age, it's what I've noticed is that they haven't seen... Uh, us as a world or a nation overcome any kind of tragic things you know they were born after 9-11 so they didn't see or witness or experience us coming um, you know out of and recovering or or healing from anything so they say things like ah this is the end of the world and they get depressed and and they start thinking you know that this is it. And I told, I had a talk with my daughter. I don't know if she'll even listen, but uh, I basically said, you know, this, it's a horrible thing, but you know, you can take this opportunity and look at yourself. You know, it's trying to like go within and make sure that your compass is pointed in the right direction and that your life is going the way that you want it to. And with what, 20 something million people out of a job, that means that people that have worked at a company for many, many years have an opportunity to reinvent themselves. I mean, when you work in a company with the same people day in and day out, if you change your socks, they'll know. So yes. you, you really can't change anything. But this, I mean, we can look at it. And I don't even think it's so Pollyanna. I guess some people would think that. I like that word. Um, but the truth is that it is an opportunity. And, and we don't want to let that miss us, you know, because we can leverage on this. Well, we can. And, you know, it's just, I think part of the problem is that they are as you said, they've, they've never seen what Americans do when they come together. Mm-hmm. And they're being fed by people with a vested interest in keeping us apart. Mm-hmm. So it makes that difficult, too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they really don't have, as you said, a background in understanding these things. And the fact that our our history is not being taught accurately, and it hasn't been, I mean, government takeover of education in my opinion was Mm -hmm. a horrible thing yeah you have teachers now who are starting to teach who have never been taught accurate history Mm -hmm. and so what they're teaching they believe to be fact that's why you see you know the people that are pulling down statues they don't know who they're pulling right you know they're pulling down abolitionists they're pulling down you know, people that have championed 
every equality since, you know, time began. Mm. And, you know, it's just so sad because they're spending all that wonderful energy on negatives. And if they would just kind of, I don't want to say not by the height because I do understand the basis but we're far behind, far beyond the original match to the tender box. Mm-hmm. And I worry that, that, that his legacy is going to be lost in all the violence and destruction. Mm. So, um, you know, I just, uh-oh, I just don't know what to, um, what to consider doing with that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, um, all I do is just pray and I, I pray that everyone stays safe and, and it's hard. You know, I have children that live away from me mm-hmm. and it is just that scary. Yeah. I think, you know, trying to, um, uh, find answers and solutions to all these big problems are overwhelming and they get you depressed because you do get to a point where you're so overwhelmed that you feel like, well, there's nothing I can do. But if we each um, individually um, by ourselves help ourselves because we're the only ones we have control over. And if we um, put ourselves, if we're making sure that we are doing the right thing and that we are kind of going down the course and being good people and uh, accepting, you know, unconditional love, which is accepting, um, even if somebody has a different opinion than you have, um, you know, when you're in this place of defense where you feel defensive, like somebody is threatening your belief, um, then maybe you need to question your belief if you feel like you're being uh, in that position, because maybe there is something that someone's triggering in you that maybe you need to look at and say, okay, wait, I need to reevaluate where I'm standing on this because somebody's kind of pushing my buttons. And I think that, um, so really folks, if, each person could focus on themselves and make sure that they're operating from a really, you know, unconditional love place um, and accepting of other people. I think that it's more manageable than trying to solve all the problems with government and education. But one little bit, it, it's meaningful. It's a lot, you know. Well, like I said, you know, all I can do is pray and that, you know, flow energy and that's pretty effective. You know, it's, and all of us have that ability, no matter, you know, what you do, whether it's praying, chanting, whether it's meditation and guided energy and, you know, universal thought, then um, that is, that is a, a big deal. It's very effective. But it's really it's really difficult for me to keep my eye on the ball when it, <laughs> when I'm doing that. I have a difficult time with understanding, you know, sometimes what the best method of focusing my energy would be. So really, I just try to be the best me that I can, mm-hmm. you know. That's what I think if each person could be like you, you know, <laughs> the world will uh, be better. <laughs> well... Do you mind if I tell people a little bit about you? No, go ahead. Well, you know, we had a shift in the dynamic. And so I was very fortunate that I was, you know, touching base with, with Michelle. Michelle Freed is, she's the producer of the competition. I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Um, I just love that we have all these things to do. I have to say, I don't even think, you know, because, all right, so I'm working on two, I know I'm interrupting you, I apologize, but I have to say this, um, that 
um, there isn't really competition because I, I think, think so that either. every right, every host um, at they have a different angle Ooh. and a different personality, and um, and I think I think it's great. I love it. I love that there are so many shows out there that everyone um, you know can download or be subscribers or listen live or whatever. I think it's fantastic, and it pushes um, us as producers to find. Really really unique guests and so I like that challenge I do too no that was nothing (laughs) you know I was tongue-in-cheek because (laughs) I think that everything you've been involved with and I think Tim is fantastic but you know you are the producer of the Midnight Society talk show Mm -hmm. and you produced Midnight in the Desert yep you are the founder and a hypnotherapist at the Butterfly Effect Center. And I want to get some information on that as we go through. Um, You're a trained remote viewer. And you also attended the International School of Clairvoyance, which is, to me, quite something. And, you know, you you studied hypnosis at the Alternative Mm -hmm. Practitioners Academy, all of which are just really pretty astounding. And I think that the people that can do what you do are amazing. I know, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Project Psy or not out of Chicago, but their remote viewers and psychics are very focused on taken and trafficked children. And they have, in a short period of time with very few viewers, brought home 144 children. So I think that your skills are just amazing. I love people that yeah. do what you do. Yeah. I I um I it it kind of progressed slowly because um I'm I have never been one of those people that um you know was born or felt like I had these gifts or whatever you want to call them, uh, ever. Um, and there's, uh, my best friend, I, I, you may have heard of her, Deborah Lynn Katz. She mm-hmm. wrote three books on psychic development and we grew up together and we're best friends all throughout, you know, high school and, um, on. And at a certain point when, um, I was, uh, kind of going through a uh, separation and divorce, I decided to take a road trip with my kids over the summer. So we got in the car for eight weeks and we went all the way to uh, the West Coast, all the way to the East Coast. And in that trip, I reconnected with Deborah, And she said to me, you know, Michelle, you've always been very intuitive. You You should take my class. And I thought, me like what are you kidding what what are you talking about you know you have to be born with that and she said no everybody everybody is intuitive and it's kind of one of those things where you have to uh you know put your attention to it and nurture it and be aware of it and then there's like little techniques and things like that that you can um work on and then just grow it and 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 do it better and I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and so I, I, I took her class and, you know, I'm, I think, I guess I call myself a skeptical believer because I walk in very skeptical and then I, the, you know, it has to come to me to believe it. But uh, I got to a point where there was, I couldn't explain this anymore because there are things that would happen where I would know something. And I'm not sure if you had this experience. Like for me, if something comes to me and it comes like fast, the speed of light, and it's just, you know it, um, that is when you're the most psychic. Has that ever happened to you? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Right. Mhm. Mm hmm. Mm. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah, I think, yeah. No, it's good. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I think that... um You know, it, it just, I think the important point is that everybody has, everybody has this, this ability. It's not, uh, you know, only gifted to certain people. I think it's just the, the, um, amount of awareness. Um, and if somebody wants to work on it, even, you know, what you would think of a left brain person still, you know, I'm, programmers, for example, people that are programming computers, I really believe that they have to use intuition at some point when they're programming, you know, and they're, and they're considered left brain, you know, job, even in numbers, you know, think about stocks and people that want to, um, uh, you know, they want to, you know, do the stock market or invest money. There is an element Right. There's an element that they definitely look at the statistics and the, all that. But I think that they're also, you know, you'll, they'll say, because this is what is, uh, what they can handle. They'll say, what's your gut feeling? They won't say, what's your psychic? They'll use the term, what's your gut say? Well, that's really the same thing as saying, you know, what's your, you know, just tune in psychically. That it's the same thing. It, it's your gut. Uh, reaction. And we find, well, I know we didn't start talking about remote viewing, but we do find that um, in the study of remote viewing that when uh, you connect with what things feel like versus what, the, what, what you see, uh, it's more accurate when you're connected to uh, your senses and um, rather than your thoughts, because your thoughts can be deceiving. Um, there's a lot of thoughts that are subjective and they're not always reliable, but what is reliable is what, how something feels and everybody feels, you know, everybody feels. So that's where your, you know, your intuition comes from or your psychic energy, whatever word you want to use for it. Right, right.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And yeah. And then jump bouncing around here back, you know, to hypnosis. Uh, one of the things that we learn, um, and teach in hypnosis is the power of our words. Um, you know, just like I was, you know, saying about, you know, saying your gut versus psychic. If you say psychic to certain people, it's going to trigger a feeling um, that may be related to some, you know, a lot of people that maybe have a very strong religious uh, background and they've been programmed to believe that that's, you know, uh, taboo, right? Yeah, uh, we don't talk about that or they have a fear around it. But then if you mean psychic, but you say, oh, you're subconscious, you know, just, you know, what does your subconscious tell you? It's really, it's it's all about words and words, you know, they're very important. They're, um, you know, how we communicate people to people. And that's even going back to the first thing that we talked about um, in terms of how the world is right now is to be conscious of the words we use. And, um, and you know, um, can I tell a little story about how this uh, came to me? Okay. <laughs> so, um, my father passed uh, a few years ago and we were lucky enough to be with him. And, uh, so he was in, in, in hospice, but at home, we were taking care of him at home. And, um, I have a family that they, um, how can I say this? They, they humor me with all this stuff. They don't totally believe it, but, uh, they, Okay, good. <laughs> then you know where I'm coming from. So, um, but sometimes they surprise me, I, I will have to say. So, um, my father, um, so it was, I guess, you know, the ending, you know, and I was in denial the whole time. And I was like to the point where <laughs> I was like still monitoring the amount of time to give him medicine. You know, I'm like, oh, no, you can't give it to him yet. It has to be four hours. You're like, what's going to happen? He's going to die if, you know, you over, you know. So I was just really in denial. And we uh, we called up the hospice guy and he comes over and he, you know, looked at him. He's like, OK, you know, he's in a coma. It might be a good time to say your goodbyes and and this and that and so my brother my brother was there too and he said yeah Michelle go go do it I'm like all right fine so I I said my goodbyes and and then um we were all sitting around and my brother (laughs) just abruptly um went to bed and I'm just like that's weird like we're all sitting here like hunkering down for the night right and he's like good night everyone I'll see you in the morning. We're like, excuse me, what's happening here? So we're like, okay, maybe he knows something we don't know. I don't know. But we all kind of went to sleep. We were so tired. And we get up in the morning. And, um, you know, we're just sitting in the living room. And he's in the living room also, my dad. And my brother gets up. And he goes and takes a shower. I mean, it was so odd. And then he goes in the in the kitchen and he makes a cup of coffee <laughs> and a spoon dropped and it was very uh-huh. loud. And I uh-huh. turned and my dad's eyes opened up and my brother somehow just came, came running out of the kitchen to my dad. And he said, you know, some things to my dad. And then he waved at all of us, come, come, hurry up. And we all run and we're standing around, you know, the bed and... Um, you know, we're all trying to say our last words, like, we love you. We love you. (laughs) Like everyone's like, you're the best dad ever. Oh, we love you. And my dad had a tear came out of his eye and he smiled and he said goodbye. And then he, he left. And I, I was like, wait, you know, like over time I thought about, Oh wait, let me just finish before then that night. Um, 
or whatever, we had to talk to the funeral guy. Um, I don't know the proper words for <laughs> everybody, but the funeral dude um, right. came over to our house and my mom had to pick, uh, you know, all the things for the funeral. And um, he has a bill there and he hands it over to my mom and he goes, okay, this is how much it's going to cost. And literally all the lights in the whole house went out oh, and my. then on again. Yeah. And I go, and of course I'm always joking. I, I said, Oh, I guess my dad didn't like those prices. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so, you know, that was kind of funny, that but anyway, kind of funny. so, <laughs> so I was thinking about uh, a couple things and if there's anybody out there, I would like to get some insights on this. Number one question is how did my dad know when to say goodbye like that, like, how did he, like, he just, he said goodbye and then left. Like, you know, I guess we can think like somebody said, you know, say goodbye because you're going to leave now. Or like, how did he know that exact moment to say goodbye and then leave? And then my next thought uh, that I ruminated about is his choice in words. He said goodbye. And I'm like, he's never, ever in my whole existence ever said goodbye to me. He'd say, see you later, see ya, love ya, never said goodbye, never said goodbye to anyone. And he would always teach us that you only say what you mean and that in life you only are given a so certain amount of words. And he's always said, choose your words wisely. And that's why he said goodbye because he meant goodbye and yes. it was like the biggest lesson to me i'm like that's right choose your words wisely if you don't mean goodbye don't say goodbye and you know and then i apply that to other parts of my life but it was just a big like whoa for me you know like okay so we have to really just in society in life in your personal life it's just you know, be careful what you say. Um, you know, in the law of attraction, uh, whatever you say is what you get. The universe brings you more of. So if you say things, you know, in your day and you say, I'm so tired, well, then the universe brings you more tired. So yes. you need to speak the words like, oh, I'm energetic. I'm feeling good. I feel healthy. And, Absolutely. Uh, yes. Right? So that is uh, that big lesson that I learned from um, there. But I still, I just wonder, it's like, I just got to know, like, how did he know to say goodbye when he said goodbye? Like, what happened? You know? Well, so. do you think that maybe, I'm, I'm going to share this. I, I don't always share this, but it's so similar. It's eerie. Ooh. Um, yeah. But my dad um, was suffering from Parkinsonian dementia and was having TIAs and apparently had a big stroke because there was like an overnight shift. And my stepmother was very concerned and very upset. Took him to the hospital. They weren't going to treat anything, but wanted to put him in a psychiatric ward because there had been such a deterioration. I'm like, well, that does not sound like a good idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> put him in a strange environment with people that are, you know, not always safe. I think that's a great thing to do. But the, um, the gist of it was that he came home, um, an absolutely wonderful woman who was a friend of mine dropped mm. everything to come and care for my dad. Mm. And she is that's her, what she does. And I don't see how she does it so well, but anyway, she had experience and my stepmother continued to be in denial. And I was just kind of there hanging out. Right. And I was seeing the deterioration and accepting it as it happened and just doing what he could do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, like there was one instance when, he was talking to me and he was holding my hand because he would always move, you know, I said that he did physical therapy on an elbow injury that I had because he kept moving my arm, rocking my arm and fixed my arm. <laughs> but he was talking and said, you have, I have Alzheimer's. I have this terrible disease. And I said, well, dad, I 
I think that that's not really what people think this is. And he just turned around and Roy Orbison was singing Pretty Woman on a fundraiser <laughs> for NPR. <laughs> and um, so it was it was quite interesting. But I was like, well, this conversation's done. Hmm. And as soon as the song stopped, he turned around and looked at me. And he was like, I I don't remember things. And it, I'm I'm losing more. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you know, I'll just remember enough for both of us. And he was just, that'll be good. Yeah. And he was hanging out waiting on my sister to come. Who didn't? And I went, and he was in a very bad place, you know, Mm. physically and mentally. He was just kind of chilling. One thing I said to him was, do you see your dad? And he said, sweetheart, my dad is dead. I'm like, well, you're talking to somebody, you know. And um, the night, that afternoon, I had gone into his room and was holding his hand, and we were just hanging out. And he just kept looking at me, and I was like, Dad, I know. But she knows. I don't know why she's not coming. But if this gets too hard, it's okay just to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's not going to come here. And he said, well, you know, he squeezed my hand. And Mm -hmm. I said, but you know what I do, right? And he just kind of, you know. Yeah, I know. Kind of a look. And I said, if there's any way, could you just let me know you're okay? And he had, he had not been dead six hours and he manifested at my home in a method that was obviously him. And it was, um, but he knew, he knew he was waiting on her. Mm Mm-hmm. And when he knew that she wasn't coming, he was able to go in peace. And he looked so peaceful. Hmm. And, you know, it's just a weird thing. But but it was. He knew. Yeah. He knew that that it was time. Yeah. I just, yeah. It just, it puzzles me. Because it's like, you know, for us, you know, I know... I can look at the clock and I know it's time or I have a feeling of hunger, (laughs) but like with the death thing, I'm kind of like, what, what happened? What happened there that he knew to say goodbye? And then he, you know, it's one thing like, you know, they say that saying goodbye is the longest conversation. You say goodbye to people and then you start talking more, you know, but this was complete. This was you know, this ended. So it's fascinating. The whole thing. It's yeah, I should remote view it. That's what I should do. I, I didn't even think I should do that though. But yeah. I should remote view what happened in that moment. Yeah. Well, you know what? I don't see why you wouldn't. You know, that's something that I really believe that while our gifts are to help other people, they are also to help us with our closures and with our mm-hmm. experiences. And I think that matters so much. I'm also yeah. a firm believer if you don't use them, you lose them. So, right. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. But yeah. Do you, do you think that too? If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, we, a lot of people even say in terms of remote viewing that it's like a martial art and, um, you know, we practice like I'm obsessed. I practice every day. And, um, and I think that, uh, there are some people that don't think you can get better, but I, I disagree with that. I think you do get better. I think you get more familiar. I think you learn more so that you can do better and, um, you know, but it isn't the thing is, is when you're, uh, working on things like this, uh, it's not always reliable because there are so many factors that play into this, you know, which is one main thing is being human, you know, just being human is an issue because, uh, we, 
just want to know we we want we want certainty we want to understand everything we want everything to fit in a perfect box and in remote viewing you're kind of stepping out of that um, and things don't necessarily make sense um, because that's the nature of how this works and um, so in order to be a good remote viewer or you know what we uh, you have to um you have to really give up being he- parts of being human. So uh, I know it's kind of strange, but, you know, that that's how you are accurate. That so, is kind of strange. Yeah. <laughs> it's, do, so, um, so the remote viewing that I talk about is that the kind, uh, because there's so, again, with words, there are certain kinds of remote viewing where people just tune in and they can describe a location. Um, and that, that is remote viewing. But the kind of remote viewing that I do, I was taught by the ex-military. Um, they started the Stargate program mm-hmm. back in the 70s. And, um, and then in the 90s, it was declassified. And a lot of those guys... Uh, taught people like myself and I've been doing it for I think about nine or ten years now and uh, been working on a bunch of projects that may surprise you that's so interesting Mm -hmm. yeah so and what we do is we have paper Uh, we actually have uh, we do it in a scientific way so that means that we are blind Uh, sometimes we're blind to the people that hire us or the project manager that assigns it to us. And then we're also blind because we don't know what they want to know. They just give us a random number and then we uh, follow a protocol that we are taught and uh, then we just turn it in and they give us feedback and then we kind of go through the, the session and that's pretty much how it works. So, um, that really I've, is fascinating, Michelle. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it, it, you know, it helps because, uh, one of the things that we really work a lot on are missing people or missing animals or missing, um, items. Mm-hmm. It works very well for that. And I've worked on some cases with detectives where we were looking for missing people and, uh, I don't, they basically just say, I have a missing person case, uh, and they give me a number and then I just kind of do a session about it. So, and then I hand it in. And the idea is to just be very specific about what we see or or what we feel. And then it it helps. So one of the cases that I worked on, I'm going to interrupt you right there because we have to go to a break and what a great place to come back. Because okay. this is this is fantastic. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Good. So, everyone, we will be right back. Thank you so much for being here. See you in a sec. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. 
Join host Cat Pops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama, and I am so glad y'all are here. We did have a bit of a paradigm shift, and that's okay because we are being joined tonight by Michelle Freed. And I am one lucky host, I'll tell you that, because I'm having a great time. She is the founder and hypnotherapist at the Butterfly Effect Center. She is a remote viewer, which is where we are in our discussion now. She is a radio producer. I so miss having a producer. And she is one of the best people in this field. I think that she is somebody that I'm very lucky to know. And I'm glad y'all are getting to know her too. But um, Michelle, we were discussing your remote viewing and we left at the the beginning of a case because I wasn't going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> but would you mind picking up for us? Sure. Uh, so I got a call and basically they said, all right, we have a missing person case and that's really I didn't know if it was male female I didn't know where in the world it was I didn't know anything so um I just so they sent the number a uh, random number and I just sat down and did my session and I perceived a male um and right at the onset I unfortunately did not feel life in this uh subject I call them subjects. Um, And um, I was kind of in this bird's eye view sensing uh, where I was. And it felt like a foresty area. I noticed that there was some kind of run down building down a dirt path. There was water nearby. Um, I saw this male with blood coming out of like his forehead. And there was a rock, like a big, huge boulder he was kind of laying on the ground in a certain position and there's boulder near him and um, you know, a bunch of trees and things like that. So I I did my session. I'm giving a summary of the session. The session didn't kind of come out all beautiful, like how I described it It was kind of very chunky and bits and pieces in the session. Uh, But if you summarize, that's what it came to be. So it turns out uh, that this ends up being a uh, male on the West Coast who was a college student. This rundown building was actually a bar. He got drunk. He walked down this dirt trail, took out a boat, and the boat capsized, and he died of a head uh, head wound. So I was a little off because I did not perceive him in the water. I perceived him on land. Um... But at least what the uh, detectives were able to do is triangulate. So they kind of started with a rundown building where there was water and um, kind of uh, the boulder or the forest or whatever. And what they do is they'll take those, they kind of map it out and they find like, you know, three things that look good and they go to the area where they suspect it could be. Uh, and then they just look at a map and then they put that together and that's how they figure out or they can kind of deduce where to look and search. So we don't, you know, we are a helpers, you know, we, we're we not actually fine. We're helping them find uh, these people. Um, so, yeah, that's how it can really come in handy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so it was an unfortunate case, but I really believe that it's so important for the family to know it what you know to know what happened and anything we can do to yeah give them some peace um you know not everybody can do that but um i just kind of 
uh, told myself that it's important and, you know, there are ways that we're taught how we detach from sessions so that, you know, we can be okay. So we're, we're prepared for that. You know, I would think that would be the hardest part because a lot of the time people who have these gifts are empaths as well. And mm. the empathic side would just be a constant battle if you weren't able to learn some methodology for detachment, as you mentioned, I can't right. even fathom that. Yeah. And I think detachment should be done anytime. I mean, I think it's so important and I don't think people stress enough about it that you should be even doing it when you're with people, like not doing mm-hmm. psychic work, but just when you're with people and, um, you know, you bring back your own energy from something you know we really don't need to be carrying other people's energy with us in our space so we should always be you know if I talk to my mom it's not an insult to her I love her but when I hang up the phone I imagine that we literally severed you know we severed the connection you know or people in your lives when you kind of leave them um, you just kind of have this, you know, imagery that you're separated from them and it, and bring back your own energy. Like they don't need your energy and you don't need theirs. So uh, it's a great little tool. That is a great tool. So how long did it take for you to develop that skill? So I, I um, was trained with Joe McMonagall, um, Lynn Buchanan, Russell Targ and my favorite teacher, John Vivanco. And I learned several different methods over the years. So it's, you'll sit and learn the the class, you learn uh, the protocol, but it's really about practice. So um, I have very good friends and we're constantly pushing ourselves to uh, practice, practice, practice. And along the way, uh, we get lots of projects. Um, we were actually hired, you won't even believe this, um, by Tom DeLong. Uh, you know who that is, right? I the do. UFO guy? TTSA. So, yes, yeah. So he hired us. Uh, and and they, again, we were double blind because they didn't tell us it was Tom because we start remote viewing aliens, right? So um, they just said, we have somebody that's hiring uh, um, you to do a project and we, we're like okay fine you could we're kind of used to not knowing stuff but uh it was weird because i did get some non-human subjects in my session it was weird um so i was kind of like what the heck is this session um so <laughs> um that so would be that's disconcerting though Um, not, I mean, we do esoteric targets, like we've done Bigfoot, we do, is there a base on the moon? Um, we do all sorts of, in fact, you may even be able to see me on an episode of Ancient Aliens. Um, we were at East Seti Ranch and we did some, yeah, we, yeah, we did, um, a session. I think the name of the episode is Transdimensionals. Um, so that was really a fun uh, project to do. So, um, yeah, so there is just so much. And then there's a whole nother area that people are interested in where it's a different kind of technique using remote viewing to, um, uh, to, uh, to predict a future outcome. Uh, so we did a scientific study where we used our dreams to predict a future outcome. And we associated it with um, wagering on sporting events. So how it worked was we had a a manager that set up the project. We had, I think, five viewers and we did 50 trials. And the idea was that on Friday nights, we would set an intention to dream about a photo that will be shown to us after a game. And this photo would represent the team that won. And so then we would do the session, make a prediction, and then they would wager on it. Um, The games played, and then they would send the photo back to us and then, you know, finishing up the loop. So we did uh, 50 trials, and I think we had like a 62% uh, hit rate. 
Uh, and that's incredible, that, isn't it? Yeah, and that paper is published in the Journal of Psychical Research. So we were really excited about that. So, um, but yeah, there's just people are using remote viewing to bet. They're using it to uh, big corporations hire us to help them with investments, and um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. I mean, it just never ends. So, but and it's I fascinating. do fascinating. Yeah, it's it's it just really cool. <laughs> There's also healing. We use it for healing or identifying people or locating um some kind of physical condition that people have. Um and I I do teach a class. So, um if anybody is interested, um I'm interested. Okay, I would <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> We could have like a, a fun class. It would be really fun. Um, I, I'm I was gonna start August first, but um, it just things got so busy for me. So I think I'm gonna start the next class in September. Um, so I usually do it on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. between ten and twelve uh, Pacific time, and it's a six week course. And uh, if you want more information, it's on Butterfly Effect Center. Dot com and uh, the remote viewing page uh, will give you all the details. I didn't change the date yet, but it still tells you what you learn. And um, I am looking for a really good team so that we could, you know, make a little mama needs a new pair of shoes, bunny. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to, uh, you know, help, uh, you know, do projects where they pay us. So I'm always looking for a, a fantastic, big, great team. Uh, so I like, you know, teaching to, to find those people. Is it difficult to find people who, A, are interested in doing this, and B, have the skill sets necessary? Um. Um, every, I mean, people, when you tell them about the possibilities, uh, I haven't heard anybody that, um, that wouldn't, are not interested. Everybody is like, wow, you know, that sounds cool. Can I do that? That's kind of the reaction. You know, would I be able to do it? And of course I say, of course, if you want to, yes. Um, there are, um, people that um, I think the hardest part of this is being committed and practicing. You know, it's yes. kind of one of those things where you do need to practice. Where the homework matters. <laughs> the homework does matter. You know, yes, it, it is. Does. It's, it's it like is the karate kid. Wash on, wash off, wax. wash on. Wax. Oh, wax on, wax off, wax on. Yeah. There you that go. Was, I know something. It began with a W. You were close. Flashbacks. You were all over that. <laughs> but, oh my God. You know, I just love this. I'm having so much fun. And thank you so much for being here because this is fun. This I is am, fun. Well, yeah. you know, it's, um, we have never gotten to really chat and so get to know each other other than, I, I know some of what you do and I like your work and it's just great. And I really admire you because I'm producing here and I never started out to be a producer. I'm a host mm. Mm. <laughs> and right. <clears throat> my former network producer disappeared and like literally. The, yes. Should I remote he, um, view it? <laughs> no, he's, he's back, but he said that he was going into rehab for six, 600 days Ooh, and that we weren't uh, going to be doing any more live shows. And he took the passwords that I had paid for. Oh with no. Him. And I was interviewing George Nori the next night. So, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, so it was trial by fire. I had no stingers, no music, no anything except George. Aww. And he called in and and it was terrible. I was so tense and he was so gracious and he was helping me along because, you know, he knew I was Aww. tense. I mean, the biggest interview that I had ever done mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. he had had me on with him and I've really admired him. And so I reached out and said, you know, would, would he be interested in coming on with me? And he did. So 
when I saw him at Contact in the Desert uh, a little bit later, I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Aww. I know that wasn't the level of professionalism you expected. And he was like, you were excellent. Aww, and, like, and for that, great. I love you. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Well, but, you know, that's the thing is that, you know, people, you know, people are, uh, they're, when they're open, you know, they don't, they don't, they understand, they understand the situation and, you know, you tolerate it, you accept it, you know, definitely. Well, he um, was perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's good. Really I'm glad was. it turned out. Me too. But we have to take our top of the hour break. And oh. if you're listening, this is a great time to go and um, fill up whatever chalice you're using with what your choice is. Maybe do a uh, few tumbles around the room, loosen up. We'll be back. And thank you all for being here. We'll see you on the flip side. Support for this podcast and the following message come from LAist Studios, presenting California Love, a new audio memoir about L.A. Host Walter Thompson Hernandez shares stories of people and communities of Los Angeles that hardly get recognized. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from NPR News, I'm Barbara Klein. Supplemental jobless assistance for millions of Americans during the coronavirus pandemic remains uncertain after lengthy talks yesterday between Trump administration officials and congressional Democratic leaders. Participants said some progress was made, but they fanned out on the Sunday talk shows today reiterating their positions. Here's Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin on ABC's This Week. We have to be careful about not piling on enormous amounts of debt for future generations. So the president's determined to spend what we need to spend, and we're acting very quickly now. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says workers should be the priority. They're subjecting somebody who gets $600 to scrutiny that they won't subject some of the people who are getting millions of dollars uh, in the PPP. So this is about putting workers first. Mnuchin is pushing for a one-week extension of the extra $600 in jobless benefits that expired Friday. Democrats call it a political stunt. Tropical storm Isaias is slowly moving up Florida's east central shore. NPR's Huo Jingnan has the latest. Isaias is whipping up winds up to 65 miles an hour and is forecasted to bring rainfall from Florida to New England in the coming week. The National Hurricane Center is watching for possible storm surge from 2 to 4 feet in South Carolina and North Carolina. The NHC is also warning of flooding due to rainfall, and Florida's governor has warned of power outages due to falling trees and branches. The storm continues to bring heavy wind and rain to northwestern Bahamas. Huo Jingnan, NPR News. The U.S. military has ended a search for seven Marines and a sailor. Their small craft sunk off the California coast Thursday. Steve Walsh of member station KPPS reports. The Navy had been searching since Thursday evening after the 26-ton amphibious assault vehicle sank quickly in sight of other vehicles during an exercise in the waters off of San Clemente Island. Eight Marines were recovered quickly, including a Marine who died and two others still remain in critical condition. After searching a 1,000 nautical square miles, the Navy called the search for the remaining eight overnight. Unmanned vehicles will search for the landing craft, which is believed to have sunk in several hundred feet of water. The head of the Marines, David Berger, ordered a temporary halt to all water operations for the aging AAV. For NPR News, I'm Steve Walsh in San Diego. NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken safely returned to Earth this afternoon, splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. Welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. They conclude the first manned mission of a privately built capsule, SpaceX's Crew Dragon. This is NPR. White House...
Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator Dr. Deborah Burke says the U.S. is in a new phase of the coronavirus outbreak. She says infections are extraordinarily widespread in rural areas as well as cities. According to the latest data, more than 4.6 million people in the U.S. are infected and more than 154,000 people have died. Leaders at a summer camp in North Georgia are apologizing after a wave of coronavirus infections there. Georgia was one of the first states to reopen during the pandemic. Roxanne Scott of member station WABE reports. In June, after a teenage counselor got sick, the virus quickly spread throughout Camp High Harbor. The overnight camp is run by the YMCA of Metropolitan Atlanta. High Harbor shut down shortly after, but by then more than 260 people had gotten infected. The teenager who first tested positive provided a negative test and no symptoms when first arriving. All campers were screened. Though staff were required to wear masks, children were not. A CDC report found that there was poor ventilation. For NPR News, I'm Roxanne Scott in Atlanta. In Southern California, fire crews are battling a wildfire northwest of Palm Springs that's already burned more than 23 square miles. It's 0% contained. Thousands of homes are threatened, and some 8,000 people have been ordered to evacuate. I'm Barbara Klein, NPR News. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back for the second hour of Fate Mag Radio. I am so glad you're joining us because we have had the best possible outcome from a shift in the dynamic. I know that I advertised a guest, but we have someone different, and I am having the best time. I am talking with Michelle Freed who is just really a wonderful person. She is a remote viewer. She is a hypnotherapist with the Butterfly Effect Center. She is a radio producer at the Midnight Society radio show. And not only is she a hypnotist with the Butterfly Effect Center, she's the founder. So she's also all kinds of other things, as we're learning tonight, and I am having a ball. So... If you have any questions, please do put them in chat because she is, she is really fun and interesting. And Michelle, I never believe in circumstances being a coincidence. So this was just destined to happen. Mm -hmm. Even if it was a little, you know, uptight. (laughs) Excuse me. So that absolutely went down the wrong way. Oh but no. It's okay. I am I am just really thrilled to be talking with you. Thank you for doing that. And you did it on oh. the fly and it was so <laughs> smooth. You were so smooth. Thank you. Oh really? Well you made it easy then. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of like, all right, take deep breaths, just focus, calm down. Yeah. It's well, uh I was saying the same thing, so maybe we were just reinforcing each other. Yeah, we for sure we were. But shifts in the dynamic sometimes work out well. So I think this did, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Well, Yeah. I know that when we were going to break, um, we were mid-flow. And quite frankly, I am just, if you want to continue where we were there... Or would you, where do you want to go? Um, uh, I don't even remember where we were, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> well, okay. um, so, um, yeah, anything, I think, was I talking about my class? I think I had just well, finished. Well, we had talked about that. And yeah. um, that's going to be 10 to 12 on Sundays. No, Saturdays. It's six. Yeah, Saturdays from 10 to 12, six courses, uh, six classes, um, and I'm looking for a team. I think that's what I was kind of discussing. Yes. So Kind of emphasizing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And that people yeah. can do it, even if they don't know that they can. Yeah, I mean, they did a lot of research. Um, 
when they put together the team back in the 70s, uh, Russell Targ and um, Hal Putoff were the scientists, and they found one of the best psychics um, named Ingo Swan. And um, he... Oh, he is. Uh, he is Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and so the the three of them kind of put together this this protocol of of how to remote view, and in their process, you know, they were always experimenting, and you know, even kind of knowing them now, um, you know, everything turns out. Oh, we should do an experiment. Uh, like anything you say, it's like, oh, we should test that. Oh, you know, yeah. it's this mind of these kinds of people that are, you know, scientific mentality. They just like, oh, we should try this. We should try that. So one of the things is they took. Um, I think I can't remember her name, but it's pretty famous um but she i think she was a photographer and they just uh ingo's like hey let's just see if she could do it and it turned out that she was an incredible remote viewer that and they didn't expect it because she was just like an everyday person or whatever um and and she was able to do it so they kind of realized that um you know, really if people are taught you know, this protocol, they can follow the steps and, and get information that, and the other thing that I'd like to uh, point out, a lot of people are psychic and they get bombarded with information. Like they could be like driving the car and stuff comes in. Um, remote viewing is a discipline where you can filter out when you want to be psychic and when you don't want it. You don't have to live your whole life with this spontaneous information coming in and overwhelming you or or if you just don't want this information, it, it'll teach you how to kind of turn it on and turn it off. And I think for a lot of people, it, it, it will help them ground them and uh, function better in life, especially people that have their aperture wide open and they're getting all this information, psychic information and you know they they use a word again with the words but they they call themselves sensitive i'm a sensitive person well mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way because you can be trained to um turn it on and turn it off and uh and i i, I mean i like knowing that I have power over it. I like to be an empowered person. I don't like things happening and I, you know, without my control and, yes. um, you know, whatever. So that is another advantage to learning remote viewing in this process. And, uh, and then also the idea that it's very scientifically based, you know, it's, uh, it is, I guess, kind of woo woo what they say. Uh, but I think that it's, you know, more scientists will, for, for example, I've actually had a couple professors in a university hire me to do uh, work for them. Uh, authors of some books, like legitimate, not that we're not legitimate, but like people you wouldn't expect to be open to this, um, in especially in the academia world. And they are, they, I mean, and they were, they were willing to put money on it. So, um, yeah. So it's um, definitely something that uh, is useful, even in your everyday life. My that mom once called wonderful. me. She, <laughs> my mom once called me, uh, kind of teasing me, and she goes, "Michelle, I misplaced the can opener. Can you tell me where it is?" <laughs> <laughs> that like, is Thanks. so funny. <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah. laugh because I have friends that are very, very good and trained at this. And the day of my daughter's wedding, I was clearing off a counter and I put some Jimmy Buffett tickets up and I put them up in a cabinet. I know I did. I know where I put them and they were gone. One of them was not mine. And so I put the word out to two or three different people and I said, look, I need help. I'm going to owe somebody like $200 and I'll have to buy another ticket. So, oh. um, you know, for me and every one of them saw me putting the tickets up in the cabinet and nothing after that. And I was like, what does that even mean? And one <laughs> of them sent me a message back and said, you have house elves. You're going to have to fix that. 
like, well, that's old. mean of them. They, they can't be here if they're going to be like that. <laughs> oh, my but, gosh. Yeah. I love it. But, I mean, I was kind of kidding, but I also was kind of like, I really need those. Yeah. But yeah. They, they were so great, though. They were hilarious to a T. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, I get it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, I think that there, you know, other things uh, we work on, um, well, we call it remote uh, influencing, but sometimes that makes people think like you can influence people to do bad things. But it's also um, how I think of it is we use it for healing, you know, because people will call us up and, you know, they have some kind of physical condition or discomfort or something and they want to find the origin of it. And uh, so we kind of have a technique for that too. And we can, you know, help people and, and you move in a direction you never thought you would be moving in. So um, that's pretty cool too. So, um, you you can end up thinking my knee hurts, but it turns out it's something to do with, uh, you know, something that happened when you were a child, and you know you're you're having an emotional block in your knee or something like that, because um, what we there's such a strong connection to how we feel, you know, our feelings and our our health, um, and. Uh, I kind of explain it like this. If we imagine that our brain is split into three, three sections, you have your conscious and that's the part where, um, you're, you're thinking, you're analyzing all that, you know, all that analytical part is in the conscious. Then you have your subconscious, uh, normal scientists, they just call it the unconscious. They just, but in hypnotherapy, therapy, we kind of split consciousness uh, into a subconscious and unconscious. So the subconscious, we separate saying, this is permanent memory. This is where all your emotions uh, are connected. So any word that you say or think or feel is uh, stored in there and it's attached to an emotion. So um, for example, I'll ask everybody who's listening to feel to feel sorry. And Kat, you tell me what that feels like. Can you describe that feeling to me when you feel sorry? Like for something I've done? Yeah, you know, like, yeah, you, you're, you're in a situation. Recall the last time you felt sorry and describe what it felt like. Well, it feels devastating because I actually hurt someone that matters very much to me and didn't realize it. Okay, and, and then where, oh, that's sorry. Awful. That's okay. Yeah, and where in your body do you feel that sorry? I feel it in my chest in the upper left, and I okay. feel it in my eyes. Oh, okay. So if we replace that word sorry with the word apologize to somebody, do you notice a difference between feeling sorry and the feeling you get from the word apologize? I do. It feels like the center of my chest opens. Right. So a lot of people, when they walk, so this is a connection to how your body responds to how you feel. Do you get that? So I do. That's interesting. Yeah. So I noticed a lot of, um, I worked with a lot of high school. I was a director of musical theaters, um, in, you know, high schools. And I noticed, you know, the girls especially would constantly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And their physical bodies are like curled up and they're very mm -hmm. like, yes. and I'm like, well, no wonder why, you know, you walk around with, you know, your shoulders and your neck is tense and because your body is responding to that feeling. It's acting. So that's what the unconscious is. It's that part that is responding to the emotion. So that's why we separate subconscious and unconscious. And um, so I uh, didn't even start talking about this. But um, well, because but, it was all part of the various levels of conscious. Right, right. Yeah, that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so basically, uh, that is 
uh, how I look at how how we respond in the world, and we use this in hypnosis because uh, when we're talking to to clients, we want them to be aware of this power we have, and um, and 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 uh, that's how we can control it by being aware of it. You know, our physical when you get a cold, people do say, oh, I have a cold because I'm so stressed. It it brought my immune system down. All those things are really, they're based on emotions. Um, Why does a germ, why does a germ, a COVID, um, well, I don't know if we can even prove this, but um, a germ, let's just say a germ, Mm -hmm. uh, two people in the same place, one person got the cold and the other person didn't. How could that, you know, how did that happen? Well, I believe that it's because maybe one person, you know, had maybe a better disposition, their emotions were, you know, less stress or whatever. And the other person was probably immune system brought down from so much stress and they were um, vulnerable to get this, this virus or bacteria or whatever. So I think that, um, you know, that's another thing with people dealing with fear for COVID. That's another thing is to uh, really start, you know, you know, reducing stress. We can't get rid of stress completely, but reducing and doing things throughout the day to reduce the stress is going to, if you do get COVID, you will be able to fight it because you're healthy and you see yourself as healthy. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, kind of, I, I feel, um, how we put, wrap everything up and put it all together. I think that's absolutely spot on. Yeah. But we have to take a little break. Okay. Um, And we'll be right back. Thank y'all for being here and we'll catch you in just a moment. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say to you, still think it's a meteor, Professor. I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capitol account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers 
on WBHO Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. We are the voice of Fate Magazine. And if you have had a chance yet, we have a new edition out. We also have some packages for sale. And the way they put these together amazes me. Phyllis is brilliant. But we also have t-shirts, and we have never had t-shirts. And the whole time I've been affiliated with Fate, so I am so excited about that. Because I see everybody else's when I go to conferences, and now we have them too. That is way, way cool. So check out FateMag.com and get you one. And check out the other stuff too, because really our archives are amazing. I don't know how Phyllis keeps up with that, but I had a guest on, and Michelle, you'll appreciate this. I had a guest on, and she was like, you know, I submitted to Fate, but it was never, you know, it it was never printed, and I was I never heard back, and I and I was like, but that's a great story. So I said <laughs> something to Phyllis later, and she said, we we did print that. Let me get her snail mail, and so she sent her two copies, um, mm. you know, one for her and one to do whatever with. So I mean, she knew immediately. <laughs> What addition wow. it was even. So That's great. It is great. But anyway, little business there. But I thought that was, that's one of the reasons I like who I work for so much. It's fun. They're fun. It's important. It's important. Yes. And they're yes. ethical and honest and very with it. You know, it's a good thing. But I... I was just so fascinated when you we were speaking and you had said something about if you have yeah if you're not listening to the what the universe is trying to get to you, right? Mm-hmm. That it will get your attention one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And I will I think I can vouch for that, but I am really surprised because I just, I know that I'm hard-headed, but I don't know that everybody is to that extent. I just get caught up in the moment, but I do listen now. (laughs) I do listen now, and I do um, acknowledge and do what I'm supposed to do. The messages are much clearer now that I'm focused better. Yeah. I think um, that's, you know, I I was just talking about this to my brother the other day um, about being, um, I guess you could say, being um, aware all the Mm -hmm. time because um, a lot of things are getting thrown at you, information and opportunities and things like that. And if you're not aware of what's going on, you miss them or dismiss them. Uh, So it's important to, when you're in, you know, being in an environment and then also being aware of what's going on. Um, A lot of people just walk through life on automatic pilot. Uh, They get up, they, they have their routine, they exercise, they go eat breakfast, they go to work come home, do the lawn, you know, whatever it is. And throughout the day, and they'll say, well, my life has nothing, or I can't find a job, or I this, or da, da, da. Uh, But opportunities are constantly coming in, and you have to to see them. And if you're focused on something else, and this is also hypnotic, um, if you're, whatever you're focused on is what your attention is, is on that you you won't see anything else going on because you, it's like you're being hypnotized by whatever you're being focused focusing on. That is and, true. I have seen right? that. I've experienced that. Right. So that works for if you're being hypnotized, then we want that to happen. But if you're in your everyday life, you don't want to be hypnotized, you know, in your everyday life, even though hip, hip, hypnosis is a natural function. But 
sometimes you have to make an effort to not be hypnotized. You have to be aware of what's going on around you and, and what's, you know, coming your way. So, um, uh, yeah, well, I think be where the third level of consciousness would be. Um, what, what do you mean yourself? when we were talking about? Oh, unconscious. Yeah. You mean the subconscious, the conscious, subconscious and unconscious? Yes. Would that okay. be the unconscious? The unconscious is really your connection with the body. That's uh, um, okay. that's the unconscious. So the unconscious part is responsible for your heart beating. It's the automatic part. And so your body reacts based on what emotion you have in your subconscious. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of if you're feeling um, down or whatever, then then your body is going to react to those emotions. Gotcha. And then then you're going to start degrading in health for that. If you, you know, um, but back to because you were you brought up the other idea of <clears throat> of um, the law of attraction. When we say anything after I am, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're talking to the universe and, and I am is kind of getting, you know, God or the source or whatever word we want to use. It's getting it's, I'm going to say it's attention, the attention. And so whatever you say after the words I am is what the universe wants to bring, uh, bring you more of. Okay. So, um, one example of this is my daughter. They love me because I'm constantly, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like talking like this all the time and they're like, ah, oh, again, mom. Uh, but it's, it's important. So we're in the car, I drop her off her carpool or we're in the car and I'm dropping her off her carpool. And she's like, I'm so stupid. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. You want to be stupid? Yeah. The universe is going to bring you more stupid. And I'm like, do you want to be stupid? And she's like, no. I'm like, well, what do you, what do you desire? What do you want? She goes, well, I want to be smart. I want to be intelligent. I said, well, then that's what you say. You say, I am smart. I am intelligent because it's going to bring more to you, you know, focusing on that because our subconscious, um, protects what's familiar. So uh, this is a challenge when people want to um, lose weight. And first of all, notice what I said, lose weight. We say that all the time. Mm -hmm. So the word lose, the subconscious goes, huh, what? Lose? I don't want to lose something. What are you kidding? I, I don't want to lose anything. It's a fear. So um, so it's it, it wants to protect even though things that you have in your life are unhealthy for you. The subconscious doesn't know that it doesn't just it doesn't analyze. So it knows, well, this is what I know. This is what I'm familiar. So this weight, this extra weight on me, I don't want to get rid of it because that that's what I know. That's what I'm familiar with. So you have to work double hard to reprogram your brain to understand that that is not familiar and then a new behavior that you want, that's the familiar, and this other thing is unfamiliar. So you have to kind of reverse that, and that's what hypnosis does, is it trains you or reprograms you to take what's familiar and kind of turn it around and make that unfamiliar. So, you know, smoking is familiar, even though it's not healthy. Again, the subconscious doesn't understand it's not healthy. It just knows, I like, like, it's, I like it. It's familiar. It's what I'm used to. Um, also, you know, unfortunately, people in abusive, you know, situations, it's the yes. same thing because you people wonder, well, why are they still in there? Well, because the subconscious knows that that's familiar, even though it's not healthy. It's familiar. And the subconscious holds that like it's nothing. Yeah, I mean, like everything in the world, it wants to keep that that what's familiar. So. Um, that's really kind of w how the process works is, is, uh, recreating wh what's familiar. Does that make sense? I don't know if it I... does, but it doesn't seem like it could be that simple and it doesn't really well, sound simple, but, but it is. Right. Right. It It is simple. It's a choice. It's kind of. 
another, you know, uh, if you're listening to, okay, a podcast and you want to listen to another podcast, what do you do? You just turn the switch. That's right. really all this is. You just have to turn the switch. It's, it's really that easy. So the thing, the, the hard part is the motivation. It's, um, you know, that's what's the hard is to make a commitment. You know, you have to, because your subconscious is fighting against that. You know, it's like kind of this, uh, you have to kind of win over. And once you do, and that's why they say, what, two weeks uh, starts a new habit. Yes. And if you can do something, if you can get through that two weeks, then it, then, then it'll be, uh, very uh, fl- flawless or flowing nicely. And uh, you'll see that you change. You made a big change. So, um, yeah, it kind of, it, it works like that. <laughs> not to really minimize awesome. it. Well, not I mean, to minimize it, but. But it, but it is because um, I am, I can be highly motivated for the right stuff. But mm-hmm. I've, decided I was tired of not feeling great. So I joined a gym that was doing a, you know, pay 20 bucks, lose 20 pounds in six weeks. And if you don't, then, you know, we'll do whatever. And if you do, we'll give it back to you. Mm -hmm. It was, it was so motivating. I was at that gym every time that I was supposed to be, which is so rare. (laughs) <laughs> and well, because it was fun too, because there was a camaraderie and everyone being there to shift their mindset. And, you know, and I missed it when it was over, but mm-hmm. we already had a gym membership and I couldn't justify paying their gym fees on top of the others. But it is really amazing how you can see the, I mean, I can see that mindset was what motivated me to be there. Mm-hmm. And and it got addictive. The workouts got addictive. I love, right. I still love working out. I just am not quite to where I can fully yet. It's just right. so much fun. Right, right. And I you're, never thought and I would say that. <laughs> I know, well, it became familiar, it you know, did. and, and think about, okay, so this, so you have kind of a, you have this idea of how this is working. Um, and think about we're hypnotized by commercials yes. because the commercials are talking to your fear, your fear, uh, three things, um, the fear of security, the fear of um, reproducing yourself or, you know, reproducing. And the last one is uh, belonging. And if you analyze commercials, you'll see who they're taught, you know, which part are they taught. And sometimes they're talking to all of them, especially when you, when they're having those pharmaceutical commercials yes. where they're literally building up that fear and going, well, just take the pill. Um, because we'll take, you know, we'll take that away from you. And, uh, that's really how it works. And then we get suckered in because that's exactly our subconscious, you know, wants to, doesn't want to be, have, you know, they're afraid of these things. And then they're like, well, we'll take that away for you. Just take this little pill. Oh, really? All I have to do is take the pill. Okay. I'm sold. You know, so it, it works like that. It's, um, it's it's simple and and complicated all at the same time, right? It is. Yeah. But but you know you know you know that it works because with what an ad costs, just a television ad, standard television ad, not even a Super Bowl. Those people are putting bank into counting on this altering your mindset. The mm-hmm. psychology of that is intense. So I think that's um, pretty much a given to recognize. And people right. are always like, well, they can't do that to me. I can't be manipulated. Well, you are every day. Right. I mean, that, I right. say that. Every day. You know, I say that. Well, yeah. It won't get to me. I'm, you know, I'm knowledgeable. I'm aware. Not so much. Right. Right. It it's tricky. Yeah. Oh, um, right. Yeah. And I think, you know, 
just uh, being aware of, uh, again, just pulling it back to yourself and making sure, because that's the only power we have is over ourselves and we can't change other people, but we can change ourselves and changing the way we think and our outlook. That's the first step is um, in, in making positive changes and, and, you know, and don't even get me started on manifesting because that's all related to the way you speak. And because, um, because in the idea of manifesting or intention, it's all about your words. You have to speak specifically to what you desire. And people kind of miss that idea, you know, that old joke where they say, oh, I, I, I manifested a million bucks. Well, they get, then they got a, a million bucks you know, deer bucks in their backyard. Um, you have to be, you have to be specific that, um, that you want, you know, dollars and then you don't want to also put a limit, a uh, limitation on it. You want to, uh, say, or more, you know, I'll, I'll I want, I, I see myself. That's kind of how you want to say, I see myself with a million dollars or more. And you also don't want to put a limitation on um, how you get that money. You know, you may think that the normal way is I'm going to work and or I'm going to win the lottery, but you have no idea how that money can come to you. So uh, it's very, it's really about the words. It's it's about you know saying and and we also use that same concept in remote viewing. It's very important that uh, when we have the secret quest, we call it the secret question, which is uh, what what the remote viewer is viewing. That's what they do not see. And it's written in secret and then assigned a random number. That question has to be written because you're talking in the language of subconscious. And so it has to be uh, precise. So, for example... I'll give you an example. One, if you're looking for a missing person, one question would be describe the physical condition of so-and-so uh, or describe the current location of so-and-so. Those are very precise questions. And uh, that's what you want the viewer to be um doing the session on you don't want to have all these other kind of fluffy words in there or things that can put you off course and in a different direction that is so i can totally see that Mm -hmm. you know because if you're not direct it's kind of um it's just not going to have a straight path we have to take a break i am so sorry But we will be right back. And everyone, y'all come back too because this is just amazing. I am having the best time. I hope y'all are too. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk. Only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You're 
listening to WBHM, Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back for the final segment of Fate Mag Radio. I am your host, Kat Hobson, and I am so glad you're here because this has been a fantastic show, and I'm so glad that things worked out so that this happened. It was completely unplanned. It's been brilliant, and my guest is Michelle Freed, who is just fantastic. So if you have any questions, please do do get them in one of our chat rooms. We are in Spreaker on live chat, and we are also at wbhm-db.com with live chat as well. And that chat feeds to fatemag.com. So you can go all over the place and pick us up right now. And if you miss something, no worries. We are on iHeart, Spotify, Deezer, just about any place you want to look. I'm, It's all posted. So... If you miss something, no worries, you can go and get it. Michelle, I am really enjoying this conversation. But some of the things that we've been talking about, I have seen happen, although I didn't know the verbiage for it. And I know that since I have just decided to, you know, be a suck it up and go get them kind of a person, (laughs) my attitude is better. I don't take any kind of, uh, I do take a muscle relaxer. I don't take any kind of pain medicine that's narcotic. Mm -hmm. And I am not going to. And I'm just so thrilled because since I started making these decisions and helping my healing, my healing really is being helped. So, yeah, it sounds like manifesting the same thing. And you'll probably find it funny that I close every show with a decision discussion um as we're going out um being the change you want to see because we can Mm. manifest that right right yeah i mean uh, things people have healed themselves just by um you know i see myself as healthy or the attitude that um you know my body is doing what it you know exactly what it's designed to do mm-hmm. you know sometimes um i tell my kids you know if you have a headache or something hurts you uh, or even a fever it's not something to sc- be scared about it's your body telling you there's something wrong and it's like going yoohoo you know it uh, pay attention to me like that like yes. i i mentioned earlier about tapping on the door and then uh knocking and then to the point where you have to listen and the the door gets knocked down to get your attention so your body is constantly letting you know um, that you need to give something attention and that's really so it, it's a good thing um, a lot of people want to resist the pain and that is our natural reaction but by uh, allowing the pain to come and then releasing it, it's really just telling you there's something off here and you need to give something attention. And that's really all it is. And when you understand that, you can deal with it better. Yes. I didn't even know some of that was what was going on. I just knew that I was tired of being tired. Mm. And right, it was... Yeah, I was tired of hurting. I was tired of being tired. I was tired of feeling damaged because I did feel damaged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I don't. Now I am coping with it. I am, you know, the only thing I will do are the muscle relaxers because it helps me with the physical therapy. And Mm -hmm. it still needs to be worked. I mean, you know, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do that, I do... I do use those, but they don't do any kind of mind altering. Yeah. Did you, did you ever have a kid that was like, mommy, 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 mommy. And they're like really (laughs) annoying. They're like pulling on your shirt, like mommy, mommy, mommy. Um, So that's really what this is. It's just this nagging because it needs attention. And then once you tell, you know, give your kid attention, Mm -hmm. then they are quiet. They stop calling your name. 
until it, something comes up again. Yes. So that's really the same thing in our bodies that it's it the pain, you know, God created us this way. And, and so everything about pain or discomfort um, or any kind of disease or any even horrible things are ways that we're being you know, nagged to pay attention to whatever <laughs> yes. it is and give it some love and, and attention. That's it. And, um, and you'll see that the more you do that, you know, giving, you know, self love, it, you're going to start feeling better. And it, it's instantaneous. It is. And you know, what's tragic is that society teaches that, you know, love everybody else, but self love is not really something that we're up right. With. Yeah, up with. So, which is a tragedy too. Mm -hmm. But um, why do you think that this stuff gets kind of discounted? Do you think it's because the the medical fields, or you know, really society as a whole depends on us depending on other things? Because it's I almost think a fight. It, yeah. It is. I, I, I kind I do think about that a little bit, like why? And I think it's because taking a pill is so easy and fast. A lot of these things take a little bit of an effort. It takes attention. It takes longer, but it, it's healthier. We were designed to do that. We were designed, yes. uh, ultimately and we're, we have all the tools to handle all these things. And there are times where definitely I'm not against medicine um, at all. I mean, there are times I mean, they, where you... It works hand in hand. Right. Or it but can I work think, hand in hand. Exactly. I think that if you can do some of these holistic things along with medicine, then you don't have to take as much medicine. Yes. You know, so I... Um, uh, I yeah. So I, I think that... Uh, a balance is what's important. And, um, and again, I think it has a lot of the pharmaceutical companies and they're talking to your fear and they're telling you, just take this little, little pill. You know, your body tells you don't eat hot dogs. You know, you get indigestion, don't eat a hot dog or don't eat whatever your body is telling you. It's saying, I don't, I'm not supposed to be eating this. You know, it's nagging you and you're ignoring it because it tastes so good in the mouth. And then the pharmaceuticals come and say, well, just take this pill and then you can eat the hot dog or whatever, you know, whatever it is that, but your body is telling you, and then we just don't listen. And, uh, and you know why you, you could just take a real quick pill and then you feel better. But if we really want to be true to ourselves, and, and then we do have to listen to what our body's telling us. And it might save a lot of money if we are then buying these pills. <laughs> well, so. I'm very fortunate because my primary doctor is a, she's an MD, but she's also a holistic medicine doctor. And that has really been beneficial for me when, when I fell, um, I did not go to her because I was, I couldn't. And when I finally found her, you know, got to her, she was like, oh my gosh, well here. And she gave me an herbal supplement to help with circulation because I was mm. worried about my legs. Right. Okay. Right. And, um, so it was, I was very fortunate because I had a doctor who was open to these ideas and who actually promotes them more than I was believing in them at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are hard to find. Right. Yeah, it's true. It's, it is. Um, there's also, you know, fear. The other thing, uh, if you want to go on to that is trusting yourself. The doctors only know, what they know, but we're programmed to think they're the experts in I know, us. Right? Yeah. And they're so and, not. I mean, right. they're not. They just went to study something different than we did. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard to get there, but there's an awful lot of them. And I was lucky right. that I grew up around some medical people. So I know they're right. not God. Right, right. And, and I ha I was also lucky when the pediatrician would always say, 
hey, mom, what do you think, Mm -hmm. you know, is wrong with your kid or whatever that they always ask me my intuition, you know, what, what do I think? And, and that's a true, like my, I remember my parents listened to every single thing the doctor said, whether it went against what they felt or whatever, they thought the doctor's right. You do what the doctor said. But, um, I went through a whole period of time with one of my kids, a year of test after test after this. And it was like going through the rabbit hole, like crazy. And one day I just went, stop. And I just stopped it It, because I'm like this, I, I don't care. There's nothing wrong with my kid and I'm done. And I, you know, I was brought up to never do that. The doctor knows, but I, I, my, I was screaming inside, like, stop this. And he's fine. (laughs) He's fine. There you go. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, it really is funny how conditioned we are. Um, I had an experience with a pediatrician also, and he was just so laid back and he was just like, well, you're around them all the time. Is this normal? <laughs> so right. Nothing about my kids is normal, you know? So that was kind of a fun thing because he knew that was true. Right. Right. So what do you think is, um, with all of the, the turmoil and the strife and the, the, I equate it to Ghostbusters, too, where all the stuff is moving around under New York City and everybody's getting ill and fussy and things of that nature. Um, There's a lot of purposeful negative energy being put out right now. And what is the best way to combat that if you start feeling overwhelmed? Um, Well... I think what I tell my kids when they get in that feeling is to pull yourself back to now, you know, focusing on I'm safe now, I'm okay now, I have food in the cabinet, I have, you know, uh, right in this very moment, I'm okay. And um, that really brings you back. What is, I think there's a famous saying, the past is gone, the future hasn't happened yet, and right now I'm free of both. And I think saying that as a mantra Mm -hmm. is very helpful because like we started, I don't feel like one person can change the whole world, but they can change their world. You know, you only have power over yourself and, and keeping yourself healthy and strong, making good decisions, understanding, watching how you speak, choosing your words wisely, um, noticing if you're starting to feel defensive, pull yourself back. A very good friend of mine came up with this concept of, of whenever you have a situation, imagine yourself of the 2.0 version of yourself, like the master and ask the question, how would, you know, Michelle 2.0 respond to this situation? And then I kind of go into my, you know, Confucius or my wise Yoda And I'm thinking, okay, what would Yoda Michelle do? And it's always this kind of amazing, you know, oh, let it go. It's not such a big deal. Like all those kinds of things pop up and I can calm myself down and I don't get defensive. I, um, I, I. I realize maybe I'm assuming things and that's always getting you into trouble uh, oh, yeah. when you're assuming. So check things out. So my 2.0 version of myself is so wise. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, so, right? Before, yeah, we, yeah. before we go, I have a question for you that's mm-hmm. out of chat. And most of them have been just following the flow of our conversation, which I think is great. You know, intuitiveness helps sometimes. But this one is um, from a mom who mm-hmm. says it's a huge issue with CPS being called if a parent does not agree with or do what a doctor says now. Right. And she was curious, do you work, do you do any work with kids on the autism spectrum? Um, I guess, uh, I guess I do. And you, what work, when you say work, what do you mean work? 
like work I'm with? I'm not sure. T- t- and, oh, she's okay. listening, so she will put this in the. Okay. So if you can be a little bit more specific, I would think that she would mean maybe energy work or something to oh. give them a soothing practice. Or, because I know that sometimes their behavior can be modified by redirecting to something they find soothing. Yeah, I think um, there's, oh gosh, there's so many studies on autism. Um, I know they're doing some really brilliant work in um, uh, Israel, actually. There are these schools there. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very... Uh, because I don't know how you feel, but these kinds of um, situations, autism, I feel is a connection where they kind of bypass the material world. Uh, they just kind of pass right through and they're like in the spiritual realm and they kind of live in that place. Well, that's so, what I would agree with that. That's a, I haven't heard it phrased that way. She said with hypnosis or, yes, help with behavior, communicating is a difficult thing for them as well. Right. Um, Hypnosis, I I don't think hypnosis for autism would be useful because, like I said, they're already in a trance state. Um, So, um, like, we wouldn't be able to work with, like, you know, drug people, you know, people on drugs or... um, Things like because there are or even young children, uh, young children under the age of six are already in a trance state. Um, we can uh, maybe put powers of suggestion in there because they're already in a trance state. So, you know, for example, a, a little cute tip for moms or parents, whatever, when you want to get your kids to do something, you can. This is a perfect how you could do it. It's like on the way to the refrigerator to get your drink, take out the garbage. It's a great, it works every time, you know, on your, on your way to the sink, washing your hands, uh, you know, clean out the dishwasher. Um, that is, it's a hypnotic suggested and you're hypnotizing your kid and it, it feels so good because you're (laughs) like, Whoa, that's so great. Um, they don't even realize that you did it. Yeah. It's just like, they just do it (laughs) and they don't know how that happens. So, um, but yeah, I think for, uh, situations where, you know, people are already like Alzheimer's and, uh, dementia, any of those that the hypnosis isn't very useful, um, because like, you know, they're already in a trance state. And, uh, I think there are some hypno hypnotists that can work with them but the average i don't think you know really would work that's interesting you know she's um i'm going to assume it's okay to share this since it's in chat but she has three on spectrum and her 14 year old is um gets very emotional and she's really struggling to get him to do daily tasks that he needs Mm -hmm. to do to be able to live Right. So, yeah, that um, I think I know this sounds crazy, but um, meditation, teaching them to uh, have these tools to know when uh, it's setting triggers. So when you you making them aware of because right before they're going to burst, they have to get familiar with that little um, little trigger that click or that little, uh. and once they start getting familiar of what that is, um, you tell them to take their deep breaths and you teach them, uh, you know, inhale through your nose for the count of four, you hold it for four and then you exhale for four. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, uh, you start training them by, the best way to do it would be like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like before, uh, you eat your breakfast, do this, you know, three times before you eat your lunch, before you eat your dinner, before you go to bed. And what you want to do is train them when they're not in an event, train them when things are calm so that in the moment of an event, 
then they'll have the tool to pull out. So I use this method on my son who got migraines since he was two years old. And we we worked with him. We did biofeedback, but we also taught him how to do these breathing techniques. And so when he gets his migraine, he has learned that he can't even describe it, but he knows he's going to get a headache. And so he's been trained to feel that. And then he knows, okay, this is what I do when the headache's going to come. So um, that's kind of what I would suggest in that case. This sounds like great advice to me. So I think that's going to probably be a help. And I am just, we're out of time. But I have had the, she says she will try that with them for sure. Okay. And she can, um, she can contact me anytime and, you know, I'd be happy to uh, discuss more details. Okay. I will make sure that she has your information. Okay. So, but she's really pretty cool. But, well, with that being said, thank you. (laughs) Thank you for leaping (laughs) to the fore and coming and rescuing. Yeah, I I actually don't mind doing solo shows. I did one on paranormal experience a couple of weeks ago, but I was, you know, I was ready and I hate when there's communication problems because that means that, you know, there's something that's supposed to happen and I was trying to figure it out and I just shot you that message and yeah. there you were and it was perfect. I'm so glad that worked out. Yeah, me too. I, I, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was just one of those things. Um, yeah, so all right, it worked out. We're fine. Everyone's good. And, um, yeah, I would love people to listen to our show on Midnight Society. Um, it's it's a great show. Tim does a good job. You do too. Yeah dot fm and check it out and um and then if they're interested in my classes butterfly and if anybody knows oh, i can't hear you Well, it shows her still there. Let's go and see if we can find what everybody knows. So. I know. It's been a day, right? Hey there, I'm going, we are back on the air and you were saying that if anybody knows and then you were gone. Oh, if anybody knows um, an author that um, needs a publicist, um, my my website is litmmedia.com. So I'm looking for uh, clients that I can help. And um, so that's my other thing. And then, yeah, that's what's going on. Thank you, Kat. Well, thank you. And April says that she's heard of butterfly effects before, so it was really cool that you were on tonight. Oh, great. Thank you. Nice. Great. Reach out to me, butterflyeffectscenter.com. Don't forget the center part. Well, the center is key for some of the other things that go by that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But but thank you again so much for being here i have had a great time i have learned so much i have so many notes and (laughs) i love going back and reviewing those and the chat room is very impressed and say thank you so um, again we will be back we've got shows going everywhere this week we've got denise pride more tomorrow night with the paranormal pride i will be back on wednesday night with um, paranormal experienced with Kat Hobson and um, Friday we will be having a rebroadcast of Shelley Burke Robertson's show and I'm going to tell you this one was on Haunted Islands if you missed it it was fabulous so I am so appreciative of 
every single one of y'all. Thank you so much for listening. If you're listening to us live or if you're catching a podcast download later, thanks. Y'all are the reason we do it. And don't forget, you know, we have, I say it all the time. I know y'all get tired of it, but it's really, really true that if you don't like what you're seeing out in the world today, change it. You can do that. And as we were talking about in the show tonight, you can manifest things with your intent, with your words. You can change environments. You can change yourself. You can change everything. So I just think it's important. And I think that you need to take that power and just, you know, take ownership. It's your world. Wherever you go, wherever you belong, that's your world. And you have the authority and the power to manifest through positivity and make it a place that you want to be. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you next time. Same cat time, same cat channel. Good night.